Good evening and welcome. Um, I'm Michael Schober, Dean at the New School for Social Research. And on behalf of the New School for Social Research and my colleague Lisa Servan, Dean of Milano, the New School for Management and Urban Policy, I'd like to welcome you all to the third Paul H. Douglas lecture on ethics and government. This series, established with the support of the Bridgewood Fieldwater Foundation and Jean and Ned Bandler, honors the late Senator Paul H. Douglas, whose service to our nation earned him the moniker, the conscience of the Senate. In keeping with one of our proudest traditions of the New School, the series provides a forum in which the broader public can examine questions surrounding ethics and government and hear from notable individuals who have first-hand knowledge. As I'm sure you know, the New School, from its inception, has been an institution that is keenly aware of ethical questions that pertain to governments and other aspects of social life, and as an institution that has always engaged these questions in very direct ways. For example, when New School founder Alvin Johnson rescued a group of endangered scholars from the rising threats of national socialism in Europe and established the university in exile at the New School as a safe haven for those scholars in 1933, the New School was taking a major stand against the unethical actions of certain governments in Europe and reaffirmed itself as a place where ethical questions are not only considered and discussed, but actively engaged and confronted. I'm proud to say that that commitment to social justice that informed our founding moment continues to be an essential part of who we are today, as evidenced by tonight's lecture and the ongoing commitment to critical rigorous inquiry which it represents. It is most fitting that we have with us tonight a distinguished speaker who recognized the importance of action in promoting ideals that make us better as a nation and as individuals. I'd like to now bring to the podium another former distinguished U.S. Senator who will introduce you tonight's featured speaker, New School's President, Bob Carey. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, Senator, there was a very irreverent uh, Nebraskan by the name of Bob Devaney. Uh, who was recruited to be the football coach in, at Nebraska in the 1960s before the NCAA changed all the rules and made it illegal to hire football players. Uh, and Devaney put Nebraska uh, on the map in terms of football, but he was, he was constantly saying things that were inappropriate. And one of the things he said that's relevant to this evening's event, he said, uh, no matter how much good you've done in your life and how many good deeds you've done in your life, the only thing that will determine the size of your crowd uh, at your funeral is the weather. And I'm <laughs> presuming that, that weather has had a bit of an impact on this evening's crowd as well. So I'm going to thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, 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 this event is done in collaboration with uh, the New School for Social Research, uh, Dean Schober School, as well as Milano, the New School for Management and, and, and uh, Urban Policy. It's a well-timed program. I was just uh, saying to Senator Stevenson that it might be as interesting this evening for he and I to have a discussion about the nature of the Senate and how it's changed uh, over the years. Um, I think it's more appropriate, however, for him, for us to get a chance to hear the uh, presentation uh, that he has prepared uh, for us tonight. Uh, most people here probably know uh, my, my, my first introduction to politics was the 1952 and the 1956 uh, presidential run. So I've uh, knew your name before I knew you. Um, but in the Senate, uh, Senator Stevenson was the first uh, chairman of the Senate Ethics Committee. And he was charged with implementing a code of conduct, code of ethics, uh, which he helped draft. He co-authored as well legislation that helped establish the Department of Energy, uh, fuel efficiency standards and projects for the development of alternative energy uh, sources. And I think he must feel some considerable pride to finally have, and not by likely a coincidence, former senator from Illinois and now as president of the United States, probably the strongest uh, advocate that, that, at least in my lifetime, for alternative energy, gave a marvelous uh, speech yesterday uh, on the uh, subject and appointed uh, to the uh, Department of Energy that you helped create uh, uh, something sort of symbolic for the kinds of appointments that President Obama's make. You, know, you don't expect to see an energy secretary also have a Nobel uh, uh, prize, uh, but uh, to have an energy secretary who's also a Nobel laureate, normally uh, that doesn't happen. So uh, uh, your legacy lives on, and it should be quite exciting to see what uh, can, is going to happen with uh, your legacy now that uh, we have a president who cares deeply about it. Uh, Senator Stevenson also uh, authored the International Banking Act. Uh, he has an extensive private career as well in the area of international finance. I'm very happy, I'm very pleased to welcome 
him today because his uh, life really does exemplify what the Douglas Lecture Series is all about. Uh, he describes uh, uh, this quite eloquently in his recent book. It's called The Black Book. Uh, Restoring American Values to American Politics. It's a different sort of black book than the one that I had uh, prior to uh, surrendering my uh, bachelorhood uh, after arriving here at the new school uh, eight years ago. Before I turn the evening over to Senator Stevenson, I also want to thank the Bridgewater Field Water, Bridgewood Field uh, uh, Water Foundation and Gene and Ned Bandler for underwriting this important lecture series. Uh, Ned was an extremely important a part of my life while I was in the Senate. It's very helpful to me uh, over the years in many, many ways. And so it's a special privilege for me to be able to thank uh, both he and Gene for under helping to underwrite this uh, lecture series and doing so much as well to help make it a success. I'm going to thank our trustees as well as our members of our volunteer community uh, who have uh, continued to uh, help us uh, good times and bad. Uh, they do a tremendous amount of work on behalf of uh, the new school and it aids us greatly, uh, Senator and BM will present uh, uh, noticeable and important events uh, such as the event we're ab about uh, to begin. So, ladies and gentlemen, I just ask you to welcome and join me in welcoming <coughs> the Honorable Adlai Stevenson III. I have a trustee yeah, dinner. Thank you so home. much. Well, apropos the uh, senator's comments about the audience and the weather, uh, my uh, book, which he mentioned, records a speech by uh, Governor Al Smith. He addressed the uh, inmates of Sing, of, uh, Sing Sing uh, Penitentiary, beginning fellow citizens. And then he thought to himself, uh, that the inmates had at least temporarily forfeited their citizenship, so he he began it again anew. He said, uh, "Fellow convicts," and uh, that wasn't uh, appropriate. So he um, began. Well, I'm glad to see so many of you here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Dean Schober and. Uh, and friends, I'm delighted to be here and uh, delivering this uh, lecture for, is an honor for which I am uh, grateful and I also feel uh, unworthy. Paul Douglas's moral and intellectual integrity was of the highest order. Uh, it was un uncompromising. Uh, he's a giant in the history of the United States uh, Senate. and. Uh, I think the new school uh, shares the integrity which he exemplified in his life and is a very worthy host of this annual uh, lecture. Recalling uh, <clears throat> Paul Douglas recalls another politics and um, another America which I have tried to capture in this uh, uh, book. It's based on a uh, a Stevenson Political Archive, um, lessons from the history we experienced, uh, which start <clears throat> with Abraham Lincoln in central Illinois and end in uh, modern China. It spans uh, five generations in my family, including two which produced running mates of Paul H. Douglas. Lincoln uh, recorded humor, anecdote, and story for his uh, speeches, and he inspired my uh, great-grandfather, Adlai, one to do likewise in a binder, which um, expanded over the uh, generations as a source uh, for our uh, speeches and became known as the uh, Black Book. As um, word of the Black Book spread, wit and wisdom, came in from supporters all around <clears throat> the world. It did uh, more for the speeches of my father and my grandfather than for me. Mike Royko of the uh, Chicago Sun-Times said, my speeches made the blood run tepid. <laughs> <laughs> but it also records some neglected moments in our history. Great-grandfather Adlai Wan, then a student, later 
Vice President of the United States records great-great-grandfather uh, Jesse Fell proposed to uh, Senator Stephen A. Douglas uh, joint discussions <clears throat> with a lawyer legislator, Abraham Lincoln, of popular sovereignty, in other words, whether democracy should free its citizens to establish slavery in the territories. The seven debates of three hours each uh, followed. They drew people by foot and wagon by the thousands to their uh, politics. The issue would be resolved by war, not by our democracy. Jesse Fell is described by uh, Harold Sinclair in his years of growth. He made a fortune in real estate, but he gave it all back to uh, his community, among many causes, founding the um, first uh, public university beyond the Appalachians, the community newspaper, which is, known, which is called the Bloomington Daily Pantograph, which signified some sense of First Amendment obligations as well as the Greek classics. Um, he was um, a citizen um, who persuaded uh, Lincoln uh, to give him his autobiographical sketch, which he then used to promote Lincoln for president after the debates brought uh, Lincoln national attention. <clears throat> Fell was charged by the 1860 Republican uh, State Convention with organizing its delegation to the National Convention for Lincoln. That was my family's first uh, Republican convention and the last. <laughs> um, but during the span of uh, the Black Book, which closed in early 2008, um, Lincoln... Uh, and all the great uh, presidents were candidates of party leaders, party organization. Um, on the other hand, there might never have been an Abraham Lincoln, the president, without Jesse Fell, the citizen. Our founders were creatures of the Enlightenment, conditioned by centuries of dynastic and religious warfare in Europe, the intolerance of Calvinism in the New World, and and of course by the revolution. They had read their Locke, their Montesquieu, and Voltaire. And after locking the doors to the Constitutional Convention in 1787 and pledging themselves to secrecy, they erected a wall in the New Republic between man's spiritual house where God reigned and man's temporal house where reason reigned. They created a, a representative form of democracy with a limited franchise made universal, the democracy more direct. Over the years, senators would be elected uh, directly. But as democracy was uh, reformed, usually in the name of more uh, democracy, it became less democratic in some respects. A paradox emerges in uh, this uh, black book. More democracy could make it less democratic and less accountable even as the demands of governance became more challenging in an interdependent, dynamic, nuclear world where peace was a condition of human survival. <clears throat> Man was passenger on a fragile spaceship, Earth dependent on vulnerable reserves of air, water, and soil, and trillions of dollars in foreign exchange shoot about the world each day with the speed of electricity. I was a 17-year-old uh, sergeant arms at the 1948 Democratic National Convention <clears throat> in Philadelphia, stationed beneath the rostrum, charged uh, with clearing the aisles of rumpled, sweaty politicians. I was security in those days. When a young, uh, unknown mayor of uh, Minneapolis and candidate for the United States Senate challenged that hot, smoke-filled room full of politicians to do their duty and adopt a strong civil rights plank. Um, they rose to Hubert Humphrey's challenge. They drove much of the South out of the, out of the party, Gene remembers. Um, Harry Truman was nominated for president 
cousin Alvin Barkley for vice president. And in Illinois, the party, the Democratic Party leaders gathered behind closed doors to endorse a former New Deal bureaucrat, a senior official of the Roosevelt and Truman administrations during World War II, an architect of the United Nations in isolationist uh, mid-America for governor. And for U.S. Senator, they endorsed an eminent professor of economics from the University of Chicago, a fellow Marine Corps veteran of the Pacific, though my war was one after his, <laughs> and a uh, reformed Chicago alderman for the United States Senate. Now, reform Chicago alderman is kind of an oxymoron. <laughs> Um, Adlai Stevenson and Paul Douglas were uh, candidates of the regular Democratic organization, the machine. Their, <clears throat> their nominations required uh, no fundraising. Primary elections, election campaigns were uh, formalities well into uh, my day. Party organization was strong in party uh, loyalties. Each candidate uh, headed a caravan which uh, barnstormed the state day in and out. At factory gates and county squares, they railed against the corrupt administration of Republican Governor uh, Green in Springfield, the do-nothing Republican Congress in Washington, and to quote Peter, Wright, <clears throat> Peter Cartwright, uh, one of Lincoln's opponents, Reverend Peter Wright, the flesh, the devil, and all the other enemies of the Democratic Party. At night in Democratic County meetings downstate, ward meetings in Cook County, they exhorted the faithful, many of them on public payrolls, to get everyone registered and out to vote the straight Democratic ticket. Battles were waged in the precinct, and that's the way it was well into my time. No polls, no consultants, primary elections were formalities. I was the Gov's driver. I remember no fundraisers. From the Black Book, <clears throat> a little boy's prayer in an Irish ward begins, Our Father who art in heaven, O'Halloran be thy name. O'Halloran was the Democratic ward committeeman and probably on a public payroll. Adley, too, won by the largest plurality in the history of Illinois, with Douglas not far behind. His campaign cost $157,037. Together, Douglas and Stevenson helped carry uh, uh, Harry Truman to a narrow victory uh, in Illinois <clears throat> and in the country. And if it hadn't been for the straight Democratic ticket, Thomas Dewey might have been elected president of the United States. The governor-elect searched out recruited professionals for his administration. Few came with endorsements of campaign contributors and party leaders. They didn't pay to play. They sacrificed to serve. They, sacrifi <coughs> they sacrificed to serve as they had in the New Deal, and they would in the New Frontier. Willard Wirtz, uh, then a uh, professor of law at Northwestern, recalls a telephone call from the uh, governor-elect um, asking him to serve as chairman of the Liquor Control Commission. And he said, the what? <clears throat> I don't know anything about liquor control. To which the, uh, gov, the gov, as he was known to friends, replied, uh, you know how to keep your hands out of other people's pockets, don't you? That's all you need to know. Word served, he and, we, <clears throat> he and most went on to serve in high places in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. Not one went on to be a lobbyist or a convict. Three have governors since already. <laughs> Rod Blagojevich uh, was not the choice of party organization in 2000. Rod Gavoyevich was uh, the popular choice, raking in the most money and winning the uh, primary. The party's leaders tried to persuade me to head him off, to run a third time for uh, governor, but it was too late. Well, the Gov uh, 
reformed uh, state government, blocked in the uh, legislature. He appealed to the people in weekly radio broadcasts, and they responded. Wirtz called it idealism with muscle. The Gov explained that uh, he did this publicly. Cleanliness is next to godliness, except in the Illinois legislature, where it's next to impossible. <laughs> But the politicians uh, went along. He replaced some 30,000 Republicans, uh, Republican state employees with good Democrats, one of whom um, explained that he'd been a lifelong Democrat ever since he got his state job. <laughs> um, of course, 30,000 is something of a come down in my family. Uh, Adley won as assistant postmaster general in Grover Cleveland's first term, replaced 40,000 Republicans with good Democrats. A public service for which he was rewarded with his party's nomination for vice president in, 19, in 1892 and was elected. He ran again with Bryan in uh, 1900. His Democratic Party fought, fought the trusts and the tariff. It stood for the Republic, not the Empire. Empire won. In 1952, after an eloquent uh, welcoming address to the Democratic National Convention, um, Adlai too was nominated for president. He entered no primaries. Uh, he started that campaign at the convention with no money, no staff, no program. Volunteers uh, assembled in Springfield and helped prepare program and, and speeches. Men like John Kenneth Galbraith, Archibald McLeish, Poet Laureate, John Bartlow Martin, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. Door to door dollars were collected for half hour eloquent substantive speeches to cheering partisans. In the presidential campaigns of 52 and 56 and during the Eisenhower interregnum, the presidential candidate and the titular leader of the party began the strategic arms limitations process, laid the programmatic foundation for the new frontier in the great society. Schlesinger called Kennedy the executor of the Stevenson revolution. The opposition did more than oppose. Democracy was not a means to power, it was a means to inform the people so they could make a sound judgment. What won was more important than who won. Trust the people with the truth, he said, all the truth. <clears throat> In 1966, behind closed doors, the party organization led by Richard J. Daley, mayor of Chicago, and more to the point, chairman of the Cook County Democratic Organization, slated me, then a state representative for state treasurer. An aging Paul Douglas was up for re-election and facing a bright, young, moderate Republican named Charles Percy. I was Paul Douglas's running mate, and <clears throat> alone uh, narrowly survived a uh, Republican landslide. The Senate, which Paul Douglas and I served in, bears very little resemblance to the Senate uh, of today. The center <clears throat> was broad and firm. I recall no partisanship, even during Watergate in Vietnam. Senator Douglas told me he sent his uh, Republican co colleague, uh, um, Carl Aiken of uh, Vermont, a $50 campaign contribution. And Aiken returned half the amount with his thanks, explaining that with the $500 he had raised, he had more than enough to assure his reelection. <laughs> I served on the Democratic Policy Committee. I remember no partisanship, uh, no incivility, let alone earmarks, money and membership dues for congressional leadership. We discussed policy and the legislative uh, agenda. Reason still reigned. But the 70s was a, a transitional decade. The mass media and its trivialization of the dialogue, the money for advertising, the breakdown of party organization, 
the black arts of the consultants, publicists, and money raisers all began to converge, and at all levels. The state government I returned to in 1982 as a candidate for governor bore little resemblance to the state government I left as state treasurer in 1970. It was overrun by lobbyists and interest groups, law firms and investment banks were cashing in, party organization was <clears throat> raising and dispensing money, the old patronage of menial jobs for precinct captains, the foot soldiers, was outlawed. Patronage was rising to a level of audacity and magnitude never experienced in the Black Book, its roots in the Gilded Age in Cook County notwithstanding. Here in New York, a mayor spends a million dollars a day of his own money to seek re-election. That's more than I spent in each of four <laughs> campaigns for governor and senator. And believe me, it didn't come out of uh, the pocket. <laughs> um, well, as ideologues, uh, were departing China in the early 80s. Ideologues began arriving in Washington. Reason would reign in China. Um, president Clinton was the first democratic president of the uh, new era. The New Deal wall, which protected uh, commercial banking from investment banking and proprietary trading, was taken down under Clinton. His administration rejected uh, regulation of financial derivatives. Aid to dependent children was repealed. Millions of children dumped from the welfare rolls in the name of reform under President Clinton. And then in 1994, a new breed of political partisans took control of the House of Representatives. <clears throat> the regular order the deliberative process which had um, evolved over the years that Paul Douglas and I knew was dying. Thomas Mann and uh, Norm Ornstein document the death of the House of Representatives as a deliberative body in their book, The Broken Branch. In 2006, these longtime uh, Congress watchers wrote in the New York Times they had never seen the culture so sick or the legislative process so dysfunctional. The presidential race in 2008 cost $1.8 billion. The House and Senate seats at stake cost roughly $2 billion. And that's only a part of it. Between 1998 and 2008, banks, insurance company, hedge funds, and the like paid an estimated $1.7 billion in political contributions and $3.4 billion on lobbyists five for every member of Congress. The crash of 2008 followed, and bailouts for those too large to fail. Now the health care <clears throat> pie is being carved up. Even foreign policy is on the block. The Israeli lobby has become a model. India has a lobby. The transfer of technology to India follow, follows uh, undermining the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty. Armenia has a caucus. One of the first sacks of the so-called de facto government of Honduras was to hire well-connected lobbyists in uh, Washington. Even China is reported to be hiring public relations firms. Along the way, our democracy lost balance. Primary elections proliferated, campaigns were lengthened, Conventions became media events. Presidential candidates were forced to spend years pandering to local interests, raising money state to state. Many of our reforms, and I was a reformer from day one, many of them were sound. In the Senate, we adopted a broad code of ethics, required personal financial disclosure, limited campaign contributions, created an ethics committee to enforce the rules, we took its duties uh, very seriously, but credible evidence of uh, misconduct was rare. We created a special committee which reorganized the Senate for the first time, realign <clears throat> realigning uh, committee jurisdictions with 
contemporaneous issues like energy and the environment. But some of our reforms uh, came undone and others had uh, unexpected consequences. Uh, members had closed the doors when it came to the markup sessions and line by line uh, wrote the legislation to express the uh, will of Congress. We opened the doors to let in the sunshine and let in the lobbyists, the lawyers, <clears throat> the consultants, uh, rarely the mass media, although the hearing of the Ethics Committee on the peccadilloes of a senator would pack the house. The interest groups, the publicists, lobbyists, and consultants proliferated to take advantage of the new uh, access, and the money flowed. For a time, we uh, retreated uh, to close to conference committee meetings to reconcile differences in legislation passed by the uh, two houses um, and remove favors for special interests and constituents adopted in public with confidence that they would be removed in private. When we opened those doors, we had no place remaining to represent the public interest with impunity. The history of uh, direct democracy from ancient Athens to the first French Republic to modern California is cautionary. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of California recently delivered an extraordinary statement for a sitting justice. He pronounced from the bench um, that the government of California was dysfunctional because of direct democracy and government by referenda. In the life cycle of nations and empires, not so democratic China arises. The dollar sinks like a barometer of global confidence in our capacities for corporate and political governance. So how do we regain some balance and restore integrity to our politics, make Paul Douglas and Adlai Stevenson possible again? I'm not suggesting a return to the smoke-filled room, though it's smelling better. Um, some reforms are obvious. Campaigns could be shortened by holding all primaries on one of three days starting in June, reducing costs while forcing candidates to address national issues and a national constituency. Ballots could be shortened to focus public attention, the U.S. doesn't have to be the only nation in the world to elect judges, except for the new quixotic government of Bolivia. Political action committees could be abolished. Uh, the measures are many, but can a corrupted system be expected to reform itself? And ethics is not legislated. Ways can be found to drain money from the system. But the more fundamental issue, I think, is how to inform the American people in the information age, trusting their decency and good sense with the truth. James Madison stated the fundamental proposition. A popular government, or the means of acquiring it, is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy, or perhaps both. Knowledge will forever govern ignorance, and the people who mean to be their own government must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. Other developed democracies take Madison's proposition more seriously with subsidized media, near universal education through the university, their electorates are better informed. In the US, the print media and news services are dying. In the black book, every community had its newspaper, and every newspaper its community. Today, the pantograph is a cog in the wheels of a vast uh, media empire, its roots in the community largely severed. Newsrooms are being slashed, bureaus shut down, and with them die the principal sources of uh, information for electronic media. The internet is socialized and exploited to disinform as well as to inform, undermining traditional sources of information. Commercial television trivializes uh, news. <clears throat> and um, 
Um, the world is covered, is reported from a Western perspective. Reporting from on the ground in the world and with a perspective from the world is lacking. Ignorance, always easily acquired, now contributes to the irrationality of financial markets and governments. I've heard recently, and I've started checking this out, that only Al Jazeera and its BBC-trained uh, correspondents portray the world from on the ground, all the world, uh, and with a perspective from the world. Al Jazeera English uh, serves more than one billion English-speaking peoples the world over, but not in the United States. Ways might be found to govern ignorance with knowledge, as Madison suggested. But I think that is the fundamental challenge. In lectures at Chinese universities, I'm always impressed by the knowledge and curiosity of the students. They seem to have acquired the lifelong and satiable appetite for knowledge once the purpose of American schools, according to the Black Book. And that's where the Black Book ends, in China, which often bears little resemblance to the stereotypical images in Western media and journals. <clears throat> Paul Douglas and Adlai Stevenson shared a commitment to truth as they saw it. It was an uncompromising uh, ethic. It's a fundamental challenge in our politics today, how to trust the people with the truth. When the information channels are breaking down, money reigns, and the world is changing at a constantly accelerating pace. The Adlai Stevenson Center on Democracy, <clears throat> Democracy has been organized to address systemic weaknesses in democratic systems of government by bringing practitioners together from the real world to discuss the challenges and produce uh, practical answers. Its first project is how to inform people in the information age. It's a challenge recognized and I believe a mission well served by the, uh, uh, by the new school. Thank you very much. I want to leave you a couple of copies of the Black Book, and if anybody else is interested, they can be found, acquired at Adlai3.com. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, like to moderate a bit of discussion now. Uh, uh, for those who would like to ask questions, we have a microphone over here. Uh, it'd be great if you could actually use it so that um, that will appear on the recording. Um, and so why don't I start with the first question, but uh, if others would, would uh, get in line, that would be fantastic. Or you, there's also a microphone that we can pass around the room. Okay. Um, so I'm curious if you could say a bit more about uh, your foundation's work on um, informing the populace in an information age yeah. in the blogosphere in, you know, what looks to me like a real, a new form of democratization of dialogue and ma what making public what was happening in private in the past in lots of, of ways. What do you see as, or what does your group see as uh, the ways we need to change that? Well, this, this is a uh, very new organization um, housed at my family's home in Libertyville, Illinois. And we have a, you know, a statement, a project, but we have not gotten it funded yet, focused. We are working on a uh, relatively small uh, project, which is a comparative study of uh, media in five different co countries by a uh, journalist. But our timing at the Stevenson Center has not been very good. We organized it just as a you know, crash, and we've had difficulty uh, um, getting that project uh, um, uh, funded. At the moment, it's being used for e events, conferences, seminars, and, but the big long-term project on the media has not been funded. I might mention something else. I don't know if, if this would, it would be of interest in, or not, but uh, um, I was in uh, China in uh, July uh, uh, speaking at uh, a conference 
of the newly organized China Center for International Economic Exchange. China is organizing what it calls a super think tank and, with it, and trying to create a network of so-called think tanks, projects, institutions, to cooperatively address what they call economic challenges there. And um, um, I've heard from them since and been asked once again to help them design this, design their program and to develop so-called think tanks, projects for cooperation with them. Uh, they're very systematic, very rational, and if the new school has any interest in exploring, you know, um, something I want to do with the Stevenson Center, you see if we can use it as a vehicle for representation and participation in this project, probably uh, beginning to focus on uh, development of an international monetary system with uh, uh, an East Asian region, regional monetary regime. It's uh, been a, it's a controversial proposition here, but I think becoming a little less so. I'm sorry to digress, but if, if the new school has any interest in looking into this, we could pursue that. But our project on the media has not gotten far off the ground. So, so uh, what's your personal take on it was the the transformations in new media and you know members of the public uh, in on political websites and having sort of that? There are there are folks who are arguing that this is the new flowering of democratic discussion that's oh. happening in a different way than has ever happened, and that that is uh, an improvement <laughs> in in the world, not the cheapening of discourse, but rather the unmasking and making public of what was was once not public. Well, I think they ought to read my book <laughs> and discover the past. The Lincoln-Douglas debates were three hours each on one subject. Um, I can't you know, claim to be a real expert. I, I, I just don't watch television much anymore. I, don't, I think the dialogue is dead. And um, um, partly because it's more challenging than it was. Some of these issues are very complex. But uh, I think it's also partly because of that you know, absence of a global perspective. In public office, um, you can see a difference between what's reported and what's happening. And I used to try in the Senate to demonstrate that the two were not the same. I could take different news stories on the same event, and they'd be different stories. <laughs> uh, they couldn't both be right, and of course that didn't rule out the possibility that both were wrong. But that's harder and harder to do now because the news sources are converging. I can't use that methodology as effectively. But I think the disparities now are even greater between what you experience in China, for example, and what you read. Uh, not just in the newspapers, but even in journals, learned journals, magazines. Uh, um, how many uh, Western reporters even speak Chinese? I mean, if a Chinese comes here, you expect him to speak English, but does that happen in reverse? Uh, I'm not so sure. So I don't know how to convince pe people that uh, the, you know the dialogue has really broken broken down. But perhaps one way is by trying to remind them of what, it, what it, you know, what it was, and then uh, the question is, you know, what do you do about it? And other countries do find better ways than we have, and some of them now, like the French, are are organizing their own e English language programs for our media because they're so concerned about the ignorance of the American. Television is the main source, still, information for most Americans. It wasn't a Democrat, incidentally, who first called Fox News an extension of the Republican Party. The first person to use that expression was Michael Deaver, Ronald Reagan's assistant. <laughs> Just a mm -hmm. I remember in a hearing once asking uh, Rupert Murdoch, what his notions of First Amendment obligations were. Somewhere in the bowels of the Senate, 
is his rather unresponsive answer, but lost forever was the expression of astonishment, you know, <laughs> incredulity, and then disgust. I mean, what a preposterous question. <laughs> Obviously, he had <laughs> was not a subject that had, uh, to which he had devoted much thought. Okay, we have a, we have a question here. Hi, uh, one of my favorite uh, plaques in all of New York City, is, it says she would rather light a candle than curse the darkness and her glow has warmed the world. That's what your father said at Eleanor Roosevelt's yes, yes. eulogy. It's on 72nd at the entrance to Riverside Park. So. On, on that note, I'd like to hear about what it was like growing up as um, Adley Stevenson's son and whether you ever got in trouble or if, if he uh, taught, what he taught you about ethics. He didn't teach me about ethics, except by example, you know, by... Uh, what he did that I think was, what, what, and, and mind you, we were forever traveling. He was in Europe or running president. I was in school. We were kind of a disconnected uh, family. But I don't know how he started. He, you know, he's a product of the prairies, of central Illinois, of isolation. of state. Also, though, of Princeton and Woodrow Wilson internationalism in World War I. But from boyhood, he never stopped exploring this world. And I mean on the ground, in the favelas and slums and the ruins and monuments to learn about history and learn about uh, uh, people. And he'd take us with us. And we continued. Uh, uh, he did have a global you know, um, perspective. And it served the country well, I think, at the United Nations. He became a advocate for the country, and I think it influenced his, uh, um, you know, it helped make him an architect of the, of the United Nations. Uh, um, but he did not, you know, oh, well, and then, of course, uh, he, he was a challenge. I, I uh, had a lot to live up to. And uh, the only way I could meet that challenge is by starting at the bottom. So I started in the precincts and became a state legislator and a state rep and then a senator and, you know, candidate for governor. Uh, um, does that come close to answering your question? <laughs> Thanks. But you, n you never got in trouble? <laughs> oh, I tell you, in those days, uh, yes, but I... Oh, boy, I, you're going to get me wound up again. I read the black book. <laughs> and the schools were so different in those days. I went to a boarding school where discipline was inflicted, and in ha Harrow in London, too, by the big boy, by the, the, the seniors. Um, got out of line. One boy in Milton Academy has died from corporal punishment. Um, very different. Uh, um, um, I mean, when we came home, he read to us, and then we did our homework. Uh, we were taught French. They tried to teach us the piano. <laughs> Wasn't any radio, let alone television, for distractions. And every summer, um, we were sent off to some different part of the world to learn about the uh, world from on the ground or to try to learn a foreign language. Uh, um, wasn't very successful in a lot of ways, but <laughs> that was an effort of theirs, my parents. Eleanor Roosevelt, by the way, he adored. Um, and she, of course, was a great supporter of his. We knew her. She came to our home um, more than once. And she, too, in a way, had this adventurous spirit and curiosity. He remarked once, I wish I could find a mountain to climb that Eleanor Roosevelt hadn't climbed first. <laughs> Oh, 
Adlai, some of the best um, speakers in American political history have come from Illinois. Um, Abraham Lincoln, the, the Stevenson gang, and and uh, and certainly Paul Douglas. Um, we have another Illinoisan now in the White House who was a great orator, educator. Yeah. Um, and you're right that the problems of American society are rooted in ignorance, as other people have said, as you pointed out. Um, do you think that President Obama uh, can take this mantle of educating, helping the people understand uh, the political system, uh, the position of the United States in the world, and the needs for the changes that you've sort of laid out? Um, is there anybody on his team that seems would seem to be interested in helping him do that? Thanks a lot. <laughs> this is Ambassador uh, Bill Lures, formerly of uh, of uh, Springfield, had a very distinguished <laughs> Illinois, <laughs> definitely, um, who knew my father when he was governor. That's when I first met uh, Bill. Bill Delory recently was chairman of the UN Association. Well, I really don't know how to answer that question. I think the answer is yes, he could. Uh, and the hung people are really hungry. And certainly the world is hungry for a voice of America again. He's already restored a great deal of faith, I think, uh, throughout the world. Um, at least in our directions and our willingness to accept multilateralism and act militarily with restraint. Um, on the other hand, he has some t terrible challenges. I think he's moved very quickly, rightly so, to get his administration organized. Those challenges weren't wait waiting, going to wait for him, including the economic. Uh, but <clears throat> um, I don't know. I have a little difficulty. Uh, Bill, figuring out what the what's the coherence, what's the the the, the vision uh, here? Is it being reactive? Does he really think that there's a military, you know, answer to what are essentially political issues, as in uh, Afghanistan? Uh, will he go along? Um, that's a great tendency of pre presidents. It's I didn't. Uh, it's very easy to go along. As Clemenceau said, it's much easier to wage war than to make uh, peace. Um, and, you know, whether he has the will or the ability to put together an international coalition that might address some of the issues that I know you've been working on, including Iran, uh, is not very clear to me at the moment. Uh, um, And, uh, you know, it's sort of, uh, I think sometimes it's a little hard to you know, separate the economic from the political, but uh, every indicia I see, including, you know, studies like the annual studies of the uh, London School of Strategic Studies indicates that America's influence and authority is just going down, down, down with our, uh, along with our our uh, our currency. He's established some pretty high expectations, which can also be uh, disappointed. And not only the political issues. Uh, I think Iran is the, really the tragic one that doesn't need to be. Uh, but uh, can you get on top of uh, you know the financial issues and begin with other countries to try to construct a new monetary order for the uh, uh, world that's no longer dependent on an undependable uh, reserve currency. Uh, I don't see much, you know, movement there and there's not a lot of experience to indicate that he, you know, uh, uh, has the understanding. So. It's a tough question. I, I think he's so so intelligent, so well-intentioned, highly articulate. Instincts are sound. His background gives him, I think, a world view, view so that there's a lot of reason to be uh, 
uh, hopeful. On the other hand, uh, uh, the jury is out, and um, I wish I, you know, saw more evidence of some di of presidential direction on what is around him—a pretty disparate uh, group of of, uh, of, of uh, people. So I think there's reason to be hopeful, but we don't know yet. have the mic now. Dean Campbell, uh, you mentioned the dismantling of the regulations of derivatives trading. And I'm just wondering, I mean, I, was in a, I wasn't following these things closely as they developed, and I guess a lot of other people weren't either. And I'm wondering, can, would you say that economists kind of dropped the ball by not understanding this and pointing it out. The people, the few people apparently who did see uh, problems here were shut down. You know, how, how could this have gone on for so long? Yeah. And isn't there, I, mean, I was beginning to think, is this kind of risk, the derivatives, is being a kind of hedging, you know, as one goes up, the other is going to go down, so you get both of them and somehow cancel out. I was thinking, is this akin to dividing by zero? So that it's, it, in other words, risk could possibly be conceived as a kind of pain or an important symptom for economic activity. And if you disable that, uh, there's something, it, very fundamental information missing from those transactions. I mean, I'm just starting to speculate, but why, how did this get so far out of hand? And, and I think we're not out of the woods yet. No, no, I agree. Well, I hope we don't have too many economists in the room. <laughs> um, I have a chapter on, not on Derudis so much, but on the origins of, uh, of economics in the United States and as uh, an influence in policy uh, making. Uh, Harvard didn't uh, grant a degree in economics until about 1880. Um, our, uh, we got along pretty well without derivatives. <laughs> and uh, I think, uh, I, you know, I, I think if you, as you look back over the history, you, you uh, um, it's a detect a rhythm. There's the first Gilded Age. Uh, but then a response. The populists, the muckrakers, the progressives, Roosevelt and Wilson. Then the, the 20s, Depression, War. Then another burst of energy, uh, um, which inc included the Glass-Steagall uh, Act, which put up the barrier between commercial banking, investment banking, and proprietary trading, and so on and so on. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, things started, I, I think, to really change in, in the early 80s when Reagan came in with this magic of the marketplace. And that, that was a familiar old social Darwinian uh, philosophy um, of, you know, survival of the fittest. The wealth would trickle down and it didn't. People didn't matter anyway. It was seized on by the slave-owning classes in the in the uh, South, uh, um, and what I guess troubles me now is that I don't detect that rhythm. Um, as I was trying to say, much of this happened under Clinton. The money is pouring into both parties. Where's the react? You know, the reaction. If it's health care, every other developed country has a single-payer system of one sort or uh, another. Their costs are maybe half of ours. Their results are, are, uh, uh, are, are, are better. Um, you can, I'm not alone in this. I mean, you can read George Soros or, or, or one of my former friends, a really tough man, uh, Paul Volcker. 
they want to reestablish some of these walls to put commercial banking over here. And if others want to, um, institutions, want to do proprietary trading for their account in there over here. But you do not create this systemic risk. What we have been doing re recently is almost exactly the reverse of what we were preaching to the East Asians in 1997. No moral ha hazard. You have to balance your budgets. You can't bail out the banks. So hypocrisy is added to the complaints. Um, and the money pours in. And, uh, you know, I don't know all of the answers, especially on the derivatives. That gets so esoteric. But somehow or other, what's called the connectivity needs to be se sep separated uh, um, in the regulation of, der of derivatives. Maybe there's some room off to the side for... Uh, trading for your own account if you're an oil company and you're hedging against uh, uh, risk. But if you're trading your stockholders' money, um, then I think you're over here and you are regulated. And for the most part, these instruments should be traded over the counter, over the counter. I mean, in the markets, in the in the in in full view. Uh, um, so. I think there are answers out there, but what, what and, and ways to prevent this from happening. But I'm not sure that we're really taking the steps that are needed to take, not to manage systemic risk, but to prevent it from uh, happening. That's what Glass-Steagall uh, 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 did, and it, we could do it again. Maybe not exactly the same uh, walls. But if, people, if you want to go to a commercial bank, get a loan. If you want to give them to their trust department, your money for them to match it, okay. We'll guarantee the deposits. That's here. But if you're off here doing proprietary uh, tra trading, you're going to do it on your own. You're not going to get uh, you know, bailed out. That is to say, um, um, is, is, you know, is, is the problem. And it's confused a little now by this magic of the market you know, ideology which came in with uh, Reagan, it's been thoroughly, you know, Milton Friedman and so on, it's been thoroughly dis discredited, but it still has a, a following and it's accompanied by a hell of a lot of money that comes in from the banks and the insurance companies, the hedge funds and, uh, and so on. And to counteract, you've got to have a strong president. And right now we're kind of in the middle, I'm afraid we haven't. We're not out of the woods yet. Chinese don't have any problems. Boy, do they have their security <laughs> over here and their banks over there. Mm -mm. Step by step, they... Um, anyway, gets back to our politics. Uh, hi. I was wondering if you could address more directly some of these issues of ethics and communication as it relates to East Asia, which you've mentioned several times, such as uh, in Japan, their own issues with uh, business ethics and the government sort of exemplified by the recent um, fall of the Liberal Democratic Party that involved a lot of scandal, and also um, China with its issues of um, recently of business ethics and the ongoing issue of censorship. Well, let me... Uh um, go back a little. Um, <laughs> I hope you don't think that I'm not a Democrat, small d. I really am a Democrat. That's what makes me so um, stirred up. But um, when I first went to East Asia in the Marine Corps, I was 53. That whole region commanded about 4% of uh, global GDP. You guys are over there. Um, Korea, of course, was the wasteland. Uh, was exporting human hair. China was isolated. Um, the insurgencies were underway in Southeast Asia. <clears throat> the recovery of those countries 
that is to say the chopstick economies, those, those of Chinese origin, including Japan um, and Korea, they were all led by, they were nominally democratic, nominally free market. They were led by, auto, they were, hey, these were autocratic systems. Uh, Japan, its post-war recovery was first led by that great Democrat, Douglas D. MacArthur, you know, in an alliance with an emperor. Um, and then 20 years of oligarchic one-party uh, rule. Look at Korea. You, John Day, remembers. Uh, Syngman Rae and General Park, uh, not exactly Democrats. They had the power to be rational, to basically subordinate in consumption to savings, investment, industrialization, technology. Uh, development, which I used to uh, study, and to exports. But gradually, they liberalized. China is going down the same path. It's really not very uh, different from the path tra traveled by the others. And then their politics becomes more uh, liberalized, as in Japan, and it becomes a little less rational. <laughs> they begin to, Japan, have some of our um, uh, uh, problems. Now, you 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 know made made some comments about uh, about China, which reflect a very Western viewpoint. But um, what I uh, experience in China, and you know, it's a big place; you can't experience everything. Uh, but is the old Chinese ethic? It's very different. Uh, relationships, including business, are still based very largely on trust. Um, I'm a lawyer. I, my, I got into this business originally because I got tired of circumventing my own law firm and partners to get the deals done in Asia the Asian way. And then I have to do them in the U.S. the U.S. way. Well, that means piles of you know, documentation and tens of thousands of dollars in fees. Then you take it all over. If you take it to the Chinese, they say, oh, well, just show me where to sign. It's not going to be enforceable anyway. <laughs> Um, that's going to change. The systems are going to get closer and closer together. But in, in, the, in the Confucian, in the Chinese ethic, authority can be absolute, but its legitimacy is destroyed by corruption. They take corruption very, 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 very seriously. Uh, um, I don't find much. I'm sure there's corruption. And, pro and, and probably mostly at a local uh, level. But what I experience in the universities and in the government and at higher levels is a very high level of ethics. Um, and my own business, such as it is, it, it, it is based on ethics. It's 20 years of, de of developing trust. Chinese companies come to me, not because I have the best services, because they need to go some, to somebody they can trust. And they don't trust Morgan Stanley, frankly. I didn't mention Morgan, anybody by name. <laughs> uh, um, and you earn it by being generous, by being the old American like Jesse Fell, by giving. Um, there's a saying in China that give a man a you know, a, a thirsty man, a glass of water, and you receive a fountain. You, you earn obligation. And they begin to come to you, in government too, for advice and for uh, help. And corruption, I've lost two to the, sometimes they come down too hard and the innocent get uh, uh, convicted. And I'm sure, you know, corruption is universal. And when we speak of corruption, we, you know, it requires a little definition. Um, what's happening in Washington? Is that corruption? $750 million to get elected president? Doesn't cost anything to get elected president of China. Where does this, where's the line between a campaign contribution and a bribe? Why does all that money pour in? Is it Ellie Masonary? Is it charitable? Oh, I don't think so. No. That money wouldn't be pouring in if it wasn't for, with expectations. And it doesn't pour into the Chinese uh, 
system. I'm sure there's corruption, mostly at a lower uh, level, but I don't think we're in a very good position to be judgmental um, at, at the moment. And that goes for a lot of other countries too, including virtually all the other parliamentary uh, the developed democracies. Who is corrupt in this world? I'm not going to answer that. Leave that to you. Uh, respectfully, it's very disconcerting to hear that you can't legislate ethics. I think that I find that infuriating. I don't know how anyone else feels. If anyone else feels the same way sitting here, uh, I would hope that your think tank would ultimately be able to see what it can do to. If you can't, if you can't legislate ethics, then maybe you have to legislate some better form of regulation. I know in the legal profession, uh, we have the appearance of impropriety and fiduciary relationships. And that, in and of itself, uh, if, if people will not accept it, then it needs to be legislated. I mean, it's just with the inherent conflicts that people have when we read about what we've read about in the last year and a half here, uh, you know, when the meetings when we were trying to save the banks and everything, that you had a preponderance of one particular firm a huge preponderance of one of the large firms sitting in on the inner sanctums meetings. And then you have the people in the revolving door uh, who formerly worked for those firms uh, in governmental positions which were going to make the determinations on that. I do know from a perspective, I, I grew up in Washington when I was 10. I flew on a plane from D.C. to St. Louis with Paul Douglas and uh, played football on a field when Hubert Humphrey was running for president and he came down in a helicopter and asked us if go home and tell your parents to vote for uh, a neighbor for president. And I've also been a municipal attorney out for 30 plus years out on Long Island as well too. And basically we've had legislation, ethical and otherwise at a small level, and we've had to adhere to it. And granted there's foibles uh, at that level as well too, but somehow it seems like I hope that you can do something about it so it won't seem as frustrating. I, I think there's a misunderstanding. I, I'm not against regulation uh, um, and, and you know, preventing misconduct. And I agree that the, uh, just the appearance of misconduct can erode confidence as effectively as the actual misconduct. What I was meant to say or was trying to say is that I, I, you, you can, you can you know, create crimes and you can, you can uh, de deter unethical conduct. But legislating ethics, that is to say le legislating the attitude, um, I think I, I, I've been trying it <laughs> for a long time, starting in the Illinois legislature where the first comprehensive you know, ethics, conflicts of interest. I, I think it has to be inspired. I think it's a source of culture. It's a source of what you're exposed to in the uh, media and teaching ethics you know, or trying to legislate ethics in that personal sense, that's, I think, very, very uh, difficult. It can be aspired, maybe, by an example. It's a product of culture. And, and unethical conduct, of course, has to be guarded against, prevented as best we can in our professions as well as in the uh, government. But, I think leg legislating ethics is very difficult uh, in that sense of the word. But we've got a lot of experience in Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> okay, other questions, comments? Well, thank you very much, Dean. Thank you very much for coming. It's been a real pleasure having you. And, uh... <laughs>